But here are the facts. Do the facts tell you the faith? Well, here are the facts. $196,000 invested for his alma mater. Their money. And today, they have $120 million out of that 196000 And he having made some multi, multi-millions, he leaves them $20 million, plus millions in trust. Because he wants to pay back what he felt they did for him as a graduate of the University of Rochester. And he persuaded all others to do the same thing for their alma mater. If they had really applied this principle of imagining. Why, well, I tell you, God is your own wonderful human imagination. Others may tell you that it's something in the sky, as the sky. I turned on this evangelist the other night, and it was raining. All the rain coming down on him, and he had to shrug his father-in-law. Father-in-law got up and spoke in Chinese. I can't understand Chinese. Then he interpreted for us in Chinese, in English. Then he plugged his book. Then he tells this vast audience, 65,000 of them there, plus the millions who are looking, and I was one of them, and he makes a big pitch for money. This cost an awful lot of money, he said. So let us hear from you. Well, he spent the first 15, 20 minutes on struggling for money, publicizing his father-in-law. The father-in-law takes the mic and publicizes him. So the first 20 minutes went into self-congratulations. Then I turned it off. I couldn't wait any longer. Where's the message? What message is he going to give me concerning Scripture? And I could think of nothing but that word of a George Russell, the great Irish mystic, poet, and painter. And all the priests met in Dublin one year, and he wrote his friend in America. He said, a thousand priests are here for some great convention. And it has started to rain, said A. And I do hope the good Lord shows his displeasure and grounds the back of him. <laughs> well, here the rain is coming down on him. And he is telling us how he is suffering in the rain. All the others are under shelter, but he's rough, all right. But he's going to receive fortunes that night for his crusade. And that is called the work of Christ. And he's pointing on the outside to him. He's going to come from some place on the outside. He'll wait forever and never find him until he finds him within himself. And when he finds him, it's his son who reveals him. And his son is David. And David stands before him and calls him father. Then he will know who the Lord Christ Jesus is. He will know Christ who stands before him, and he will know himself as the Lord Jesus, who is the Lord God Jehovah. Only then will he know it. But now you take it and try to feel. I hope you can actually identify yourself with the dreamer. Can you come to some identification with the dreamer? So you not speak of something on the outside creating it, but your own being is creating the dream. The dream of night, and this is the dream of day. For this is just as much a dream. People ask you, never what is a vision? I said, this is a vision. Right now, this is a vision. Oh no, I don't mean that. I mean when you close your eyes and you see something. I said, this is the vision. This is just as much a vision as the vision of the night to me. My visions of the night have cubic reality, just like this, solid, real. This whole vast world is vision. As Blake said to his friends who wondered, what must I do to do what you do, to see as you see? He said, you only have to raise imagination to the point of vision, and the thing is done. But, said he, the nature of visionary fancy or imagination is very little known. People do not know it. They can't be intense about it and raise it to something just like this. It is just like this. This is vision. The whole vast world is vision. And you are the one creating it all. So this is the dream of life. When you're awake and in the dream when you are asleep. And you call that the dream. This is just as much the dream. And if you catch yourself dreaming, 
the chances are you're going to wake. But if you catch yourself dreaming and re decide not to wake, you can control the dream and make it come out as you want it. The same thing here, if you know this is a dream. You can change the nature of the dream. And so you can simply assume that you are what you would like to be, and that friends of yours are what you would like them to be, and walk in that assumption as though it were true. And to the degree that you are faithful to that assumption, having faith in God, who is your own wonderful human imagination, to that degree, it would externalize itself in your world. Now that is my story to you and to everyone who will listen to it. I would not take back one word or alter one word. The whole thing has been explained to me in the depths of my own being. It's been revealed to me. I am not speculating. I am not trying to set up any workable philosophy of life. I have no desire to set up a little church. We have too many already. All the little isms run for self-help, really, of the individual who runs them. Not for the help of those who come. It's just a personal little thing of those who set up the little organization. Well, I have no desire to set up any organization. Just to tell it to you in the hope that your memory is good enough to retain it. Now, at least your memory is aided by these things here. If you've forgotten, you can always check the little thing and play it back and then try to refresh your memory. All I ask of you is don't change it. There are those who attempt to change what I've said to make it conform to what they think I ought to have said. No, I say exactly what happened to me, so don't try to change it. As I told a friend tonight, a lady in San Francisco, she thought I should not mention certain things. She was a strict vegetarian and a strict teetotaler. And she altered my script to say that I say a man should be a vegetarian and a teetotaler. Well, I've never said that. I take my martinis every day. I don't do it six days a week and not on Sunday. I have no Sunday. Every day is my Lord's Day. So I take it on Sunday, Saturday, Monday. But every day I have a few martinis before my evening meal. And a nice bottle of wine for my lunch. That and a little cheese is my lunch. But a bottle of wine. I thoroughly enjoy it. And she dares to take what I say and then rub it out and put in her own little concept and say this is what Neville teaches. So I'm asking you one thing. Do not change what I am saying. If you approve or disapprove, leave it just as it is. I am telling you who I know to be God. And I tell you over and over again, God is your own wonderful human imagination. And all things are possible to God. Therefore, all things are possible to your imagination. And everything you see in this world was first only imagined. It had to be first imagined. This little thing called Xerox, this man called Carlson invented it. No one showed any interest. And in the 1930s, he brought it out. He was a physicist, and he knew it would work. But no one showed any interest, but he first had to imagine it. And then he executed it. Still, they would not accept it. Then comes one with real imagination, who was awake, only 36 years old, in a business that he inherited from his father, and he saw the potential. And he was willing to take all the earnings of 12 years, plus what he could borrow in loans and what he could get in issuing new stocks. And he put $75 million into a project because he imagined it and believed it. He saw the reality. If I begin to imagine now, and suddenly before my eyes comes the solid reality of what I'm imagining, who is going to tell me it isn't real? I can show it to someone else. But to me, it's real. I saw it. Well, then I will go all out and sell everything I have to prove it to the world if I had interest in business. My father did that. Every morning after breakfast, he would sit down in what we call the Burbese chair and put his feet out on the arms of a chair. It's a chair made in the West Indies. And there he would simply, with his eyes partly shut, he would see that there as he wanted it to be. He would carry on mental conversations with men he had to meet that day, from his premises, and brought them to his conclusion. And that's how he worked. And my brother Victor did the same thing. It doesn't matter what things look like in the world. 
He sees it as he wants to see it. And things come up, and now they've made millions. But millions in a little tiny place like Barbados. Put him here, he will be the Xerox setup. Because he has a vivid imagination and he knows how to use it. But as Blake said, that the nature of visionary fancy or imagination is very little understood. They don't understand it. He said, everything I see in my world is vision. The tree is vision. You think it's a solid reality? I can bring it before my mind's eye. It is just as solid as that. So I can make everything real. I know from my own experience. But I have no interest in business. I certainly could actually take a business concept and bring it to the point where I could see it to be real. But I have no desire whatsoever to go into business. So, my visions are based upon someone asking help of me. Or the Bible. Bringing it out from its so-called state and actually seeing it as something real into my world. And it's real. All these things are real. The Bible is reality from beginning to end, but it's all vision. From Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing is vision. It's not any little concept that our churches tell you about. So I ask you to test it. To put it into essence, is this, believe in God. You believe in God, believe in your imagination. So that's God. So when you're told in the 14th of John, you believe in God, believe in me also. He's telling you he and the Father are one. He tells you later on in that same chapter. You see me, you see the Father. So you believe in God the Father, believe in me also. And I am your imagination. Now believe in that and you can't go wrong. Believe in the reality of your imaginal act. And they all become facts. Every one of them. And I do hope you will start now if you haven't started. I ask nothing of you in the way of Caesar's will, not one penny. But I would like confirmation in the form of a letter. I love to feel that you're getting the results. That you don't have to share with me the fruit of this principle. I'm not asking for that at all. I've never asked for it. I've been doing this since 1938. And I've never made an appeal for my platform or in any other form, to raise money. I have never. And today I would quit and go elsewhere before I would ask you for one great penny outside of the price you pay when you come here. I have to pay for this place. And so it has to be defrayed, expensive. But I have never appealed to anyone for a penny. I started on the second day of February, 1938. And anyone who can go back far enough will know I have never once asked for one nickel. I either had to prove it to myself or else let it fall by the wayside. And so I tell you, it works. It will not fail you. But we are the offering power. It doesn't operate itself. If I know what to do, do it. If I do not do what I know I should do, that's silly. I'm going to miss the mark. Not anything else. If I know what is right to do and I don't do it, well then that's it. So let us now go into the silence and see ourselves as we would like to be seen by the whole vast world. And when we break the silence and go home tonight, walk in the assumption that we are that person. Now let us go.